My name is Tom Hammond, and I uh, work for Wayne College in Orville, Ohio. And uh, for today's class, we're going to talk about uh, 3D printing and how it works and its applications, uh, what what the, the buzz is about it, why it's so popular with people, and um, ex you know explain the functionality of it. And this is a little 3D printer that I brought along that we're uh, demonstrating for the for the class. So. Um, I've been with the university for about 30 years or so, and uh, I've, I've, um, I'm a computer technician there. So basically I run the computer labs and fix computers and break computers and, and all that kind of stuff. And, um, but also I, I run what's called a maker space in our uh, uh, building, which is a, a place where people come together to uh, work on projects with digital fabrication tools and to have community and uh, help each other solve uh, problems with uh, things they're building. So, so I've been at this for about eight years, uh, getting into 3D printing, uh, learned a lot, uh, made a lot of friends. Uh, it's just been a, a wonderful uh, way to sort of uh, empower you to make all sorts of cool things, uh, to fix things that break or invent new things that you can't buy. They're just uh, wonderful tools. So, um, so what we'll do is uh, we'll just go on and um, go from there. So what we're going to talk about today is uh, the history of 3D printing. Um, how they got started, and some of it may surprise you. Uh, we're going to talk about how, how 3D printers work, um, how, how the filament works, how the, the, the process of getting the filament onto the, uh, the platform. Um, why are 3D printers useful? I mean, what's, what's, what's the big thing about them? Why, why are they so uh, much hitting the news? And, and, you know, and what's, what are the different types of innovations that 3D printers have had over the years? Um, we're going to talk about how you design a shape to go into a 3D printer. How do you, if you have an idea in your head, uh, how do you get it from your head to the computer screen to something you can hold in your hand? There's different ways to do that uh, that are very easy or as complex as you want to make them. Um, and at the college where I work, uh, we've used 3D printers quite a bit to fix things. So I just want to give a couple examples of, of what, how we've used them to, to solve problems. And uh, Next thing is, uh, where can you find them? Where can you buy them? Uh, there's some other options too, if you don't want to buy them, that might be kind of interesting. And we're also gonna talk about uh, what's called the makerspace community. And uh, all over the, the uh, world, actually, there's uh, many locations where people come together to, um, to work with laser cutters and 3D printers and vinyl cutters and all sorts of wonderful machines, but it's, it's really more about the people and uh, people, people helping each other solve problems and, uh, and, and uh, fixing things. So, so without further ado, let's, let's talk about uh, where these things started. And uh, so, and believe it or not, 3D printing has been around for quite a long time. Um, the first idea about 3D printing came out in 1980, and, uh, which is pretty amazing. That's you know, over 40 years ago. And uh, one uh, fellow, his name is uh, Charles uh, Hall, uh, had this idea of, of using a laser beam to actually uh, cure liquid resin. So basically, this, this 3D printer here prints from the, the bottom up. It starts at the, at the base and builds up layers of plastic like a pyramid. With uh, uh, Charles's idea, it actually worked in reverse. You had, actually had a, a vat of liquid resin, and the, pla the platform, the floor, was actually upside down and it dumped itself into the resin and a laser beam would shoot from underneath because the, the, the vat was uh, clear, and the laser would shoot through the, the uh, liquid resin to the platform and then harden the resin that was touching the platform at that spot. So as the platform would raise, the laser would actually, you could selectively choose where it was hardening, and it would actually come out of the liquid upside down. Your object would be coming out upside down. So that idea uh, of, of, and they call that, uh, uh, liquid resin printing or UV printing, that kind of stuff. You know, the idea came in 1980, but uh, Charles uh, patented the idea in 1986, and then uh, started, uh, they had the very first 3D printer that he made uh, with his company called 3D Systems. So that 3D printer was um, a patented idea, it was for industry, and only his company could make it because they had the patent. But the, the big change was, is since 1986 to 2009, the patent expired. So starting in 2009, anyone can make a 3D printer and, and, and build one and sell it. And that's why you see them everywhere. I mean, there's uh, many, many different models of these uh, just about everywhere. So 3D printing, as far as being open for people to, to make and invent and sell, uh, you know, have been around for about 15 years that way. 
So that, that's where they started, which is, which is kind of cool. So let's talk about how these things work, okay, and, and how they actually make, their, make the objects. Now right now I'm actually printing a, um, a, uh, a neckerchief uh, tie, but it's actually a large version of it, so it's going to be, you know, so you can see it on the camera well. But we're going to talk about the process of, of how 3D printers actually make what they make. And it's not a very complicated process. Um, it's, it, it's actually similar to like if you're making something with a uh, ice cream uh, machine. Like if you go to Dairy Queen and you want to get something on soft serve. Uh, basically, like this object right here, which is a single flower, flower pot that someone invented on the internet. And that, what's really nice about 3D printing is, is everyone has really great ideas about uh, what they would like to have or make. And, uh, and everyone with a 3D printer can actually make what their ideas are. So it really empowers people to, to make cool things that you can't find anywhere else. So, so this one person made this flower pot that you just can't buy in a store. But the way it works is the, the, the 3D printer has a uh, hot nozzle on it. It draws a circle of hot plastic on the base of the platform. You know, and then it fills in the circle. And then the, the print head moves up, it draws another circle, and it keeps going in spirals like this until you get a shape. So basically, it's in the you know, same, same way as if you think of a hot glue gun, same basic idea. It's actually extruding hot material to, to make an object. So, so this, this type of, of producing items is called additive manufacturing. So you're adding material one layer at a time to, to make your object. Uh, traditionally, things are made with a process called subtractive manufacturing. So if you think of a, like a bowling ball, and you have a cube of material, whether it's wood or you know, any kind of material, you would chip away if you're making, like you're carving a statue to make your object, uh, and then you're left with a solid bowling ball or a solid statue, and then you have all these carvings that have to be thrown away. So subtractive manufacturing is wasteful because you're throwing away a lot of material that you might have paid for, um, and what you've made is very heavy because it's solid material. And, and that might be a benefit in some cases, but in some other cases, like if you're building airplane parts, uh, a heavy object won't be beneficial to keeping your plane lightweight. So we're going to talk about how 3D printing solves some of those problems. Now as far, far as the material goes, this spool here is called filament. And uh, filament is uh, basically, there's, uh, it can be many different types of material. Uh, most 3D printers work with plastic filament, but you can also have rubber filament. Um, you can have, um, uh, you know, uh, infused filament with metal, so it's actually plastic filament with, with metal pieces in it. You can have wood infused filament. Um, just, there's many different kinds of uh, materials that can go into to your 3D printers. The most common kind of, of uh, filament is called PLA, and that stands for polylactic acid. It's a cornstarch derivative filament. Um, and it's very easy to print with. So, so usually whatever you make with PLA filament has a high chance of, of succeeding and not uh, failing. And by failing, I mean is plastic is a very temperamental material. Uh, when it comes out of the, of the head, it has to stick to the platform. But plastic, if it cools too quickly, it can actually curl off, the, the edges can curl up, and then you won't have a flat surface to the bottom of what you're making. Or if you're making something very large, like maybe something like this rocket, the, the it, big objects could actually cool too quickly and your layers would crack. So every it builds layers of plastic and you might have separation. So, so PLA plastic is the best kind for beginners and it's also the best kind uh, if you're making most things that are for indoor use. Now PLA has a, uh, a, a, a low melting point so whatever you uh, take outside, if you take something with PLA and you put it in your car over the summer, the, the hot car would actually cause your, your shape to actually get soft. So if you need to print things for outdoor use, um, the most common kinds of plastic are what are called uh, PETG, which is a, uh, a food safe plastic. So you can actually make things that you can uh, put the food and drink into. Uh, and another kind is called ABS. And ABS is a, uh, a common plastic used for Lego. And if you've ever uh, tried to break a Lego uh, unsuccessfully, you know how strong that kind of plastic is. And um, so there, there, there was one report where a, a ship was, um, I think, I can't remember where Lego was invented, but it was overseas. And a ship was actually delivering Legos to the United States and, and some of the uh, containers uh, fell off the uh, ship. And that was 20 years ago. And to this day, there are reports of Lego pieces still washing up on shores around the world. 
So it's a very durable material. But ABS is very difficult to print with. So it has that problem with warping where if you're not careful what you're making, what the, the bottom edges might curl up as it cools too quickly. Uh, there are ways to mitigate that. But overall, if you're learning 3D printing for the first time, uh, stick with PLA plastic. And if you want to get into outdoor plastic, uh, start with the PETG plastic. So, also there's another kind of uh, 3D printing. Uh, this is this is the uh, the plastic kind that does metal, and uh, so that's called laser sintering. And the way laser sintering works is it takes metal powder and then it takes a laser beam to cure the powder. So you might have uh, a platform and you're trying to make an object. You know, like we can try this again. So what will happen is, is the machine will put a fine layer of powder on the platform. A laser will go through that layer and cure certain parts of it or harden it with the laser beam. And then another layer of powder goes on top of it. The laser cures it again. And it builds up this block of powder with a laser cured, hardened part inside. So when it's all done, you can actually reach in the powder, shake off all the powder, and you've got your, your metal uh, part. So that's another uh, common kind. And if any of you remember a, a talk show host uh, called uh, Jay Leto, he's a car buff. And, uh, and he was into the 3D printing stuff, you know, you know, pretty early and stuff. And he has a lot of old cars. And when you have an old car with uh, parts that break, uh, you just can't go to the local, you know, junkyard and pick up parts for a Model T Ford or for some of these other cars. So what he would do is, if he had a, a broken car part, like an intake manifold or something, he had a, a 3D scanner. So he could take the broken manifold, put it on a, on a you know, podium, and scan it with a 3D scanner so that the shape of the manifold would go into the computer. And then he and his technicians would actually remove the, the, the defect that was on the computer screen, like if it was a crack in the manifold. They would, they would heal that with the computer software. And then use a uh, metal sintering machine to laser print you know, a, 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 another metal manifold. So he could make his own car parts with, with 3D printing. So, pretty cool stuff. So let's go on to the next thing here. So the way this works is the filament goes into this print head. The print head goes to, to a certain temperature. It depends on the kind of plastic you're using. It can get up to uh, 250 degrees Celsius for ABS. Uh, PLA doesn't need to be quite as hot, but regardless, the nozzle gets pretty hot. So as it passes into the nozzle, it turns into a liquid and comes out the bottom, you know, just like an ice cream cone. And then the platform on here, this print bed, is also hot. It's not as hot. I think it's about maybe 100 degrees Celsius. It depends on the filament you're using. And the reason why that's hot is so that when the plastic comes down and touches it, it has a higher chance of sticking to the bed and not releasing in the middle of a print. So having a hot print bed is pretty important, especially for ABS, to make sure your print actually stays put uh, during printing. Now, as it's printing, it prints in everything like a layer. So if you think of a pyramid, uh, every, every layer builds on the, on the layer beneath it as it builds up these layers of plastic. How thin the layers are uh, determines how smooth your print is. And this is really hard to see, probably with the camera, but this, this frog here has very thick layers. And, uh, and if you, if, you, know, you may be able to see it or you may not, but you can actually see ridges because the layers are so thick. So if you think like, a, like if you're building a, a, a concrete and you put layers of concrete down, um, you can actually see the, the bumps. So thick layers will print very quickly because you don't have as many layers to make your object. So if you need speed, you know, you want to get something done quickly, uh, using thick layers of plastic will get the job done fast. Um, but if you use really fine layers, like this vase, um, you get a very smooth finish, but it takes a lot longer. Most 3D printers, uh, your, your default setting for layers is, is 0.2 millimeters, which is about two sheets of paper thin. So by default, pr 3D printers print very fine layers uh, on things. So, but you can change that to get to get better speed. Okay. Another thing that's important about 3D printing is called infill, and I don't have a picture for this, uh, so you you have to look at the slide that comes with this video. But infill is what goes on inside of your print. So if you remember, we talked about additive subtract, uh, manufacturing and, and subtractive manufacturing. Uh, this is called additive. So, and with, uh, with additive, um, you're building every layer of your object. Subtractive is the bowling ball thing, where you have a solid bowling ball. Now, if you're making something like um, 
I don't know, like this frog, because you're printing every layer inside of this, you know, as it's building it up, you're building the whole thing at once, you can control what goes inside of this frog. You can make it solid plastic, or you could actually make it like a honeycomb mesh that has a certain percentage of, of plastic uh, and air. So if you have a wide honeycomb pattern, that's you know a lot of air and not a whole lot of plastic. That is called infill. And you can define how much air and plastic, you know, how, how fine you want that honeycomb pattern to be. And the reason why that's important is that determines the strength and the lightness and the speed of the part. So if you have a very, you know, dense pattern, it's going to be a strong part, but it might take longer to print because it takes more, you know, more passes to make that pattern inside, and it takes more material and more cost. So it depends on what you're trying to do. Now, you can't really see this with the camera, but we're, we're making this neckerchief tie with a um, hollow infill, so basically no plastic at all. So it prints very quickly, but, but you, you uh, pay for that with uh, probably weaker, you know, a part. It could break if you squeeze it too hard or something like that. So, which is really good about this is like if you're printing something like airplane parts, you know, airplane parts are typically produced as solid metal uh, parts for the, for the framework of the plane. Well, they're now starting to experiment with uh, 3D printed uh, plane parts that have very custom intricate shapes that are hard to manufacture uh, traditional with traditional methods. It can also use uh, infill, like that honeycomb pattern, and if you do it right, and you have the right pattern and the right shape of part, you can actually have, make a part on a 3D printer that's half the weight as a solid metal part, but it's just as strong. So now you have parts that make your planes lighter, and that, that's a big thing for, for you know, that kind of uh, stuff. So infill is a very uh, important thing. The other thing, when you're printing stuff, because the layers are, are layers on top of other layers, like you're building a pyramid, uh, what if you're printing something like uh, this Yoda shape here, okay, where the ears, okay, are hovering, there's nothing underneath the ears, right below here to the bottom, see that? So the 3D printer can do the base of the Yoda figure pretty easily, because it's, it's like a pyramid shape, right? But when you get to the ears, when the printhead moves to start drawing the ears, the, pla the plastic will actually squirt out and fall down because there's nothing holding up the ears. So there's another feature that you turn on in your 3D printing software called supports. So that would be, it builds temporary pillars of plastic as it's building the base here, so that when it gets up to the ear and the ear starts being extruded, the plastic will rest on those pillars and then the ear can be finished building. So, and then you break off those you know, pillars when you're all done, and then you have your shape. So some 3D printers uh, can, um, you know, build those pillars automatically. So if I was making something like this rocket, okay, like this one's actually separable, uh, a 3D printer can build this with no problem because every layer has something underneath it to, to build up the other layers. Now, a neat trick about 3D printing is I can still print this shape upside down, and as long as you have a 45 degree angle, or, or, or an angle that's you know 45 degrees or, or more this way, there's just enough lip to hold the, the previous layer on the next layer on top of the previous layer. So as long as you have a 45 degree angle, you don't need to put on you don't need to put on support. You don't have to build those pillars at all. It'll actually print that just fine without supports. So that's actually kind of a, a neat trick. So some printers um, can actually print what's called dissolvable supports. So this printer here has one print head. Some printers have multiple print heads, and they can actually print with two different materials at the same time. So if you're printing like a, like a small model car wheel and you want it to have rubber uh, treads on it, you can have one nozzle printing the, the regular wheel out of plastic and the second nozzle printing it out of the outside of the tire out of rubber at the same time. Or you can have one nozzle printing your object out of solid plastic like Yoda, and the second nozzle could print the supports with a different kind of plastic that's dissolvable. So when you're all done, you have a Yoda that has these pillars underneath the ears, but when you soak Yoda in water for about four hours, the dissolvable stuff melts away, and then you've, you've got this. You don't have to try to pick off the, the supports, which is kind of cool. So some printers can do that too. Okay, so why are 3D printers so useful? I mean, you see all these cool little uh, trinkets and toys and things like this. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're much more than just fun things that you can print. You can make very... Uh, almost every possible uh, industry you can think of, um, any type of educational topic, 
anything that you're into, like either music or aviation or medicine or you know ponies or whatever you can think of, a 3D printer can can be involved and, and help solve problems with almost everything you can possibly think of. So you'll be surprised. Um, there, there are uses. We're going to talk about that in a little bit too. But one thing that's really cool about them is, is they can make things that are already put together just by how they how they print what they print. 3D printing is a, is a different way of, of manufacturing things. Like we talked about the subtractive manufacturing where you're chipping away material. Uh, you could have injection molding where you have a mold and you squirt material into it to make a shape. Uh, 3D printing, can, you can make things that you, uh, that you can't make any other way. So like something like this, this is called our, our Makey robot here. Okay, and this was actually made on this little printer here, and it was um, made by a designer that made it so that the printer actually prints it already assembled. So you notice that the, the legs move, the, the knees bend, the elbows, the arms turn, the head turns around like poltergeist. Uh, all this was actually designed ahead of time to actually print like this in one step. So if you notice, it actually printed sitting down on the printer, sort of like that, okay? And then the bottom of the, of the Makey robot is all flat. See that? So it's all flat like this. So here's the head. See, it? it's on like a little circle here, so it can spin. But you notice that all the hinges, like the legs, the arms, they're all vertical, like this. So, as, so that when the printer is printing it, it actually designs the outline of the robot, and it prints all the robot all at the same time with all the hinges facing vertical. So basically, when it comes out of the printer looking just like this, because all the hinges are vertical, you can actually take it out of the printer and break open the leg, break open the other leg, you know, loosen up the arms, and you've got this. So you can make things that are pre-assembled, which is which is pretty pretty impressive. So you know, if you're doing a manufacturing thing, you don't have to go through the steps of trying to put parts together. Um, this is called a planetary gear. So basically, these are you know, it's a what is that? Seven gears with the middle one there. And all the gears, it prints vertically like this. So it prints everything all at once, all the layers. And when it comes out, it's actually already a, a moving part, which is, which is kind of pretty cool. So uh, 3D printers are really good for making things that you can't find or you can't get anymore. So if, if there was something that you could get you know, 20 years ago, and, but that might have gotten discontinued, uh, a 3D printer can, can reproduce parts for you. Uh, the, uh, the company Airbus uh, had an airliner where they had seatbelt buckles from one of their older airplanes, and, and they would outsource when they're when they're building one of their jumble jets. Some parts they would outsource to other companies, and uh, some of their seatbelt buckles were actually broken. But the company that they originally made them from didn't make them anymore. So Airbus turned to 3D printing to make uh, replacement air buckles for some of their seats, you know, so they could make them in house and not depend upon that company anymore. So really handy. Um, so at home I have an entertainment system that has, or furniture, that had a door that had a hinge on it that, what was it, the, uh, the, the axle on the door that it rotated on, the top part of that axle had a plastic brace that kept the door from falling off, and that brace broke. So I actually took the brace out, I did some measurements, and, and drew the same shape on the computer screen, 3D printed another brace, and now I fixed my own entertainment system without having to throw it away. So you can do things like that. You know, you get ideas that really lets you make things that you couldn't make before. 3D printers are really good for making fast prototypes of things. So if you're, if you're a company and you're making something like your Ford Motor Company and you're making a new kind of car and it's got an intake manifold uh, and, you're, and you're making the, the early version of this car to, to do a beta test, every time you need to build a, a, an intake manifold, you've got to hire a machinist. They have to make it out of metal. And they have to, you have to hire people to actually build that one prototype man manifold. And that can cost Ford up to half a million dollars per manifold to make a beta shape. And if they, if they make the manifold and they stick it in the car and they find out that it wasn't quite right and they have to make another one, they have to hire the machinist again, make another one. It's very costly. Uh, with 3D printing, they can make uh, similar parts. They might be made out of metal or they can be made out of plastic, depending on what they need. But they can make it very quickly. Uh, they could probably 3D print a, a manifold in, in like a day. It might cost them $3,000 to make a manifold on a 3D printer. And then they can, so it's called iterative design, where you have a shape, and you like the shape, but you need to make a slight change to it. You can change it on the computer screen, send another copy to the printer, 
uh, get another copy in your hand in a couple hours. It's a very fast turnaround to get the, the perfect shape you need. That's why these are very handy for, uh, for industry. Uh, they, they can make quick designs to, to get to the perfect shape that they're working towards. Okay, so what can you use a 3D printer for? Um, and, you know, if, if you want to get into a career with these kind of things, it's amazing what you can get into. Um, for a veterinary, if you want to get in and care for pets, uh, you know, I can't show you the picture of this, but again, look at the slides that go with the video. Um, but basically, you can have a wheel, uh, there's, there's a, a, a dogs that have, you know, maybe a leg amputated or they weren't born with, with the rear legs. You can make custom uh, wheelchairs or scooters for dogs with a 3D printer. So you can actually have it so they can push themselves around with their front feet and, and move around. So they're, they, they work for a lot of prosthetic type uses. You can make custom things that fit them. And as, as they grow and, and grow larger, you can actually 3D print replacement parts that fit them at their new age. So those are really cool. Uh, biomedical. Um, really cool stuff here. Um, and, and again, look at look at the slides that come with the video. Um, they can they can make uh, replacement ears. So if you were born with with uh, like a, there was one uh, kid that had a, a misshapen uh, ear, and basically they can 3D print biomedical material. So you can actually 3D print skin cells, or you can print blood vessels, or you can print uh, material that will graft into bone structure. And, and they can print a replacement ear that looks almost identical to a real human ear that's actually a living tissue, and they surgically attach it, you know, where the ear should go, and you can't tell the difference between that and a, and a, a normal made ear. So uh, biomedical stuff is pretty amazing stuff. Um, there was an announcement by some fella about five years ago that he 3D printed a living human spleen organ. And it was actually living, and it actually survived the printing process and all that. And then um, uh, another inventor uh, 3D printed a rabbit's heart. And the trick about printing living tissue is, as it comes out of the printer, you're printing with living cells, and you have to make sure the cells stay alive. So cells need nutrients, they need, they need blood, they need a blood vessel pattern to provide the blood to the organ. So the 3D printer had multiple syringes on it, it actually printed the the, uh, the heart muscle tissue, they had another syringe for the blood uh, cells, and they had another nozzle for the, uh, the vein network that went around the heart. So they could print all of those at the same time, and the, act the heart was actually still living when it finished printing. Now that heart didn't actually go into a rabbit, you know, but they're demonstrating that in the near future, they're going to be able to make human organs. So if you get into a car accident, or if you need a, a replacement liver, you can actually um, have one 3D printed instead of waiting for someone to donate one for you. So that's where things are heading in, in the medical industry. Uh, we talked about prosthetics, of, you know, not just dogs, but, but people. You, know, you can actually have, uh, uh, there was one, one little girl that she needed, she was a quadriplegic, so she couldn't move her, her arms too well, but her dad uh, uh, couldn't afford the um, prosthetic attachments that the, the medical industry wanted him to pay for, so he turned to 3D printing. And, and he uh, uh, actually asked a lot of people around the world to help him build a prosthetic uh, to help her move her hands and arms. So people from all over the world designed a prosthetic for her and, and mailed all these pieces and parts of her and he put this together so that she could have this prosthetic. And as she grew older and parts broke, you know, for helping her move, uh, they could 3D print replacement parts and keep it working for her. So pretty cool stuff. Okay, 3D printing is really big into houses now too. So, uh, so 3D printers can make, uh, can extrude concrete, and they can be, uh, you know, it's a very thick you know, piece of concrete uh, that it extrudes. So think of this table, maybe about twice the size, um, and think of it on wheels, and think of it as robotic, and it would move around. So the 3D printer, if it's building a house, it would actually roll up to a place where it needs to draw a room. It would actually extrude a square, right, for a room, and then build up the layers of that room. The, the robot would move to another part where another room would need to go and start extruding the shape of that room and it'd work its way around to the entire house. So it just uh, just got announced uh, earlier this week that they started figuring out how to do two-story houses with 3D printing, which is, which is pretty amazing. Uh, 3D printed houses are quicker. You can get a house uh, extruded in about two weeks or less, sometimes uh, about, about five days. Uh, it's cheaper because you don't have to hire as many people to, uh, to build the framework of the house. 
Um, so there's a lot of improvements. So, so it's, it makes real affordable housing, especially in low-income countries. Um, food. So we talked about the biomedical stuff. Um, 3D printing can make, uh, you can extrude chocolate. So if you want to make a chocolate necktie, I don't think it would last too long on your shirt, but you could do that with, with some uh, chocolate 3D printers. Uh, they're, actually, they're getting into making um, meats and other types of protein things with a 3D printer. And one thing they recently accomplished was there's a, there's a very high end called, uh, a type of beef called uh, Japanese Wagyu beef. And so they figured out a way to 3D print the, the, the muscle part of the meat, the, the sinew part of the meat, the fatty content of the meat, they're all different syringes, and trying to get the texture of that. But they can actually, if you, if you Google it, you actually see a 3D printed uh, Yagi, Wagyu beef that looks identical to something you, you get from the grocery store. So, so basically, you'd be able to, to 3D print your own meat without having to kill an animal to eat it, which is kind of cool. Okay, so uh, you can also use 3D printing to help uh, achieve uh, uh, some of your merit badges or to supplement the learning for many of your merit badges. So there's, there's a lot of, I mean, again, 3D printing applies to just about every possible topic or subject you can think of. Um, if you want to get a, a badge in archaeology, you know, how cool would it be if you could 3D print a, a bone from a, from a famous person? Or, or an artifact from an Aztec civilization that you can actually 3D print and have in your hands. There's a, a number of museums across the country that are, uh, they have downloadable 3D printable shapes for the stuff they have in their museums. So you, so you can actually 3D print your own stuff that, that you normally have to go to the museum to go see. Um, if you're into uh, uh, insects, if you get a merit badge on insects, you can 3D print your own insects to, to, to demo. Um, if you're into robotics, uh, 3D printing is really great for printing robotic parts. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. So there's, there's, there's you know, dozens of merit badges that you can use 3D printing to help you enhance what you're learning with those badges. Okay, so real quick, how, how do we put a shape, or how do we make a shape to actually 3D print? Um, if you're just starting out with 3D printing, you're going to want to download shapes off the internet. Uh, there are two major websites where people from all over the world invent things and they share them online so that you can download and print them yourselves. Uh, everything from toys to uh, replacement, replacement car parts or things for archaeology or music or something for your aquarium. Uh, there's things that people invent that sometimes you just can't buy because they're, they're people, they, they made these and they're their own ideas that you can have too. So one of the biggest repositories for online uh, stuff that you can download is called thingiverse.com. So if you can think of universe.com, thingiverse.com, uh, that's one where you can, you can share what you've made or download things that other people have made. So we actually found this neckerchief tie on Thingiverse. Somebody invented this and then shared it with everybody on Thingiverse. Another popular website where you can download really cool things is uh, printables.com. So printables.com. So think of uh, uh, Instructables or something like that. So those are two big major places where you can find cool things to, to 3D print. Now, when you go to actually finding something you like online, you download one file that's the shape of that object. And that file has an extension of STL. That stands for Stereo Lithography. And that's a very old standard that, that computerized industry machines would tell the printhead, move here, extrude, move here, extrude. It's just, an STL file is just a list of commands that tells the printhead what to do to make your object. So when you go to thingiverse.com, we downloaded an object for that, uh, uh, for the neckerchief that had an STL ending to it. And then you use 3D printing software, you load that into your software, and then you can choose how thick your layers are. You can choose the overall size of what you want that object to be. Um, you can choose the infill density, right? How strong you want the part to be. And then when you hit the print button, that shape comes out to here. So it's very easy. You download an STL shape, you load that into your printing software, and then basically you hit the print button and on your software and it comes out. So really, really fun and easy to work with. So once you get making things, like all these different kind of things we download off the internet, Eventually, you're going to want to be making your own stuff because it's it's a, it's a lot of fun, and uh, making your own shapes. And it's actually it, it's it's easier than you think. So, like this object right here, this is a is a phone stand that we made about eight years ago. This was made with only two basic shapes, 
okay, when we designed this on the screen, we drew two circles, like you're drawing it on a piece of paper, like these two circles, and we drew four lines, like this, one, two, three, four. So if you drew this on a piece of paper, it just had this plain you know, shape like this. But in the, 3D, in, the, in the computer software, we could take that shape on paper and extrude the same shape this way, so it now becomes a three-dimensional shape, like that. So basically, we drew two circles and four lines and told it to re, you know, replicate that design this way, and now you have a three-dimensional shape. So basically, when you're making stuff on a computer with what's called computer-aided design software, or CAD software, you're basically using basic shapes to make more complicated shapes. So the, most, uh, uh, the easiest way to get started to make your own stuff is with a program called Tinkercad. So T-I-N-K-E-R-C-A-D. And that runs directly in a web browser window, so you can use your computer or laptop or a tablet. And you can start making stuff right away that you can 3D print. So it's very easy to learn. Uh, and you can go to YouTube to learn um, you know, some tutorials on how to operate it. But it's super easy for all ages to get started with making your own stuff. Once you get to, you want to uh, get to more advanced features and Tinkercad doesn't quite cut for you anymore, the next program that you want to get into is called Fusion 360. And uh, that's another uh, free program you can download off the internet. If you're using Fusion 360, 360, you need to get what's called a personal license, so it is free to use and they don't charge you for it. So when you download it, say that you're using it for personal use and then they won't charge you to keep using it. Okay, how are we using these at Wayne College? Okay, um, if you look at, your, at the slides of the company the video, we have two cool things that we did with, with 3D printers. Well, we do a lot of things, but these are two that stand out pretty well. Uh, on the slide, you'll see a, a picture of a, a sink hose adapter. Um, and what we have uh, in, in, one of, in our chemistry lab, we upgraded the whole lab. We remodeled it about three years ago. And they put in new sinks in, the, in, our, uh, in our chemistry lab. And all the sinks had faucets with a rubber hose on. So when you turn on the faucet, you could wash things. But the problem was is on the faucets themselves, these brand new faucets, they had some type of um, uh, vapor trap where uh, vapors uh, would not come out into the air so you could smell the, the, uh, the fumes coming out of the, the sink. So um, the problem with that is when we turned on the faucet, the water would actually come out of the hose and all the molecules of the water would come out of the hose in the same direction. So if you took your hose and you turn on the water and you hit a surface, like you pointed the hose down at the sink, it would actually splash back up at you. Or if you had it on a surface, you know, it would splash everywhere. So, the, so that vapor trap was causing that. But one of our students had, had an idea, and this is what makes 3D printing so cool, because everybody has cool ideas. Uh, they made this little adapter. It looks like a like a, a, an insert from a drinking straw, and in this adapter they put like a little spiral pattern of plastic. So you stick this little adapter inside of every rubber hose. So when the water went through, it actually it would actually change the direction of the water molecules going through. So when you turn on the hose and you point it at a surface, it would hit a surface and fall down. So for about 25 cents to print every adapter, uh, we fixed all of our sinks. We didn't have to you know get the sinks replaced. So just because one person had a really cool idea, that's the kind of stuff you guys can do too. This here, okay, is a guitar pick for a thumb. Okay, so one of our students at the college uh, was born with uh, his his pinky and his thumb. Uh, no, I'm sorry, his three three middle fingers missing. But he wanted to play guitar. So one of our students, another student, said, "I have an idea. I can help you with this." So he designed a custom. Uh, guitar pick that would go onto his thumb, the other student's thumb, and now he could strum with one hand the guitar and play the notes with the other. So because one student had an idea and, and used a 3D printer, he actually made it possible for another student to be able to play guitar so he could uh, follow you know, what he wanted to do. That's what 3D printers can do. It can make your ideas possible. Okay, so where do you find a 3D printer? Okay, they're everywhere, uh, mostly online. Uh, Amazon is the most common place to find a lot of 3D printers, so that you can look there. If you actually want to go to a store and pick one up, uh, Micro Center in, in Mayfield Heights, Cleveland area has has a big department that you know they have a big room full of them. Um, as far as the brands, the brands to buy, uh, uh, we like a brand called Prusa, P-R-U-S-A. It tends to be it's, it's the highest rated printer over the years. Uh, it's a little pricey. Uh, it's about a thousand bucks or less, um, but it's the best quality if you just want to 
get it out of the box, turn it on, and it just works, period. If you're trying to save money but you still want a decent printer, uh, the best budget printer is called Ender, E-N-D-E-R. You can find those on Amazon. Uh, there's a website called all3dp.com. It's uh, A-L-L-3, D as in David, P as in Paul.com. It's an excellent website for learning everything about 3D printing. And they have buyer's guides. So if you, if you search for like 3D printer buyer's guide, they'll tell you every year these are the printers we recommend uh, for the budget, quality, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's a great place to look if you're trying to figure out which one to buy. Uh, but you don't have to buy one. Um, you can also... Uh, there's in our area in Wayne County. There's a, a service called the 3D Printer Lending Library, where you can borrow a 3D printer for a month or more at a time, and actually use it, and then return it when you're finished with it. So you can actually borrow it, learn it. It comes with it, its own tablet, so you can it has the software already set up and ready to go, and then that will tell you if you want to actually buy your own later on. The, the website for that is called RomicFoundation.org. You can look at the slide for that. Um, if you if you are a tinkerer and you like you know working on things and you want to see how a 3D printer works, there's actually in, in our area in the Wayne County area, you can actually build a 3D printer, not from the nuts and bolts, but from the the, the, uh, the structural parts. You can put it together, you know, the frame and put the head on and the extruder and all this. And there's a, a makerspace called the Shantz Makerspace uh, that's on the slide, and you go to their website where you can go to a class and over two or three Saturdays. You put together a 3D printer, you learn how to work the software, but the most important thing is, is you make new friends. And you can actually uh, learn from each other, and then after the class is all done, you can help each other keep them running and share what you've made, and you've started to build community. That's, where, that's what the real nice thing about the class is. Okay, and speaking of uh, makerspace community, <laughs> this is something that's <clears throat> probably popped up in the last you know, 10 years or so, but these are, these are places all over the country and, and most likely within your county uh, where you can go that have cool machines like this that you can pretty much either use for free or for like a low monthly membership cost. So uh, libraries have maker spaces, uh, uh, the bigger libraries do, and they'll have things like 3D printers and you can do laser engraving. Uh, you can probably make uh, colored t-shirts or like the Akron Public Library has a sound recording studio or a green screen, green screen video room. It's a sewing, electronic sewing machines. These makerspaces have all these machineries that you can learn to use and, all, and pretty much use for free. And, uh, and so if you, don't want to have, if you don't want to have all this kind of stuff at your house, go to, a, go to your local makerspace and, uh, and use their machines. But again, it's all about the people. And it's all about you know, learning from other people that have different backgrounds and helping each other with projects. So, and they often have classes and workshops for, <clears throat> for learning these technologies. So, so look, look, up, look them up, do a, a Google search um, in your area to find these um, local maker spaces. They're, they're a lot of fun. <clears throat> in our area, in, in uh, Wayne County, we have the Wayne College 3D Lab in Orville, Ohio. So that's, a, that's an area maker space. In Crest and Worcester area, we have the Schatz maker space that I mentioned. In Apple Creek, Ohio, we have an Apple Creek makerspace. They have a big wood shop there and 3D printing and laser cutting and CNC milling. Canton area's Champ makerspace and Akron has a makerspace too. So again, if you, if you Google makerspaces in your area, you might be surprised what you find. So if you wanted to, the, we're wrapping up here, but if you want to know more about 3D printing uh, and how this stuff works, again, the biggest uh, re uh, online resource that I recommend is all3dp.com. So all3dp.com, uh, they have excellent articles about all sorts of things related to infill and printers to buy and what kind of filament to get. If you get on their mailing list, they'll send you very useful articles uh, almost every day. They're, they're, it, it's excellent. It, they send you stuff that's really worth reading. So if you, I would join their mailing list and let them send information to you. If you're on Facebook, there's a lot of 3D printing support groups. So if you buy a certain brand of 3D printer and you, and you type in like Ender support group, like that Ender 3D printer support group, Facebook will let you join these groups where there are thousands of people. So if you're having questions or problems with something, you can post a question on Facebook and they will actually um, answer questions and you can help each other. Find your area lo local maker spaces. Um, and another place to learn about 3D printing, not actually finished, are maker fairs. 
And a maker fair is, a, is, a, is like, think of a science fair in like grade school or high school on steroids, where people can bring all sorts of cool projects, whether it's 3D printing or horses or food or exploding pumpkins. You bring anything that you're into to a maker fair and show people what you do. So uh, all over the country, all over the world, there are maker fairs. And uh, the make, our maker fair for Wayne College is on May 20th. So if you want to see a lot of amazing inventions and people uh, people make, or if you want to participate in it, look us up. You know, Google us and uh, be a part of it. So this actually finished, and um, so let's just take a look at it real quick. So basically, I'm going to try to remove this platform. The different printers have different ways of how their platforms work. This has spring-loaded clips, but you'll see. There's our part. So this, this we printed it larger than normal just so it would show, show well on the camera. But that was probably a 50 minute print to get something that large. And, and we used about, uh, you know, thick, we used thick layers to make it print quickly. So this is warm. So I'm just gonna flex it a little bit. And then the part comes off, maybe, okay. So, and that's our part right there. And we chose to make this hollow. So it's really lightweight, but it's pretty strong, you know, for what it is. And uh, so there's no infill in it. It's just a hollow print. Um, so that's that's basically the way it works. And some printers here, this is a perforated board. We put glue stick on this. This is a really helpful thing because plastic is a really tricky thing to make it stick to the platform. So if you're 3D printing something, if your printer head is too high when it starts, it may not stick because the plastic couldn't squish into the material. Uh, but we, we find you can adjust the height of your print head to make the perfect starting layer. But glue stick, this is the Elmer's uh, washable, disappearing purple variety. If we put a layer of glue stick down, it has a much higher chance of your, your object sticking to the bed. So this is a, a good trick to, to learn for this kind of stuff. So, but that's it. So thanks for uh, watching the, the class uh, video. If you need to um, contact me for any reason about, about this, any of this content, uh, on the last page of that slide is my email address and phone number. So feel free to reach out to me and I'll be happy to answer questions. Uh, come visit our makerspace at Wing College and, um, and I'll show you how the machines work and answer any questions you have there too. So thank you.